Good job, everyone. So I wanted to uh, talk about a couple of examples of kind of how you might actually apply this and go through it. So I will say, you know, these examples are simplified. We can only give you so much information now. And again, we're looking at, at plots and quote the numbers that we've been trying to tell you, hey, it's not only about that, right? But we're kind of using that as a, as a way to kind of look through how you might look at this. So again, just as a reminder, dam safety case elements, what's really driving the risk? What are those factors? Confidence, uncertainty, okay? Now, that, that will be the last time I say that for everyone, okay? So, let's do, a, do an example. So, considering the following fictitious project example. So, here we go. Here's our table and our chart that we've talked about kind of before. I'm not going to give you a lot of information, but, but here's what we have, okay? So, these were all the, all the failure modes that got routed into the level two risk analysis. There are quite a few more, but they've been excluded, screened out. Uh, ruled out for various reasons and the justifications documented. But now we've got this and the case has been made in the report for each one of these, okay? And we've got a risk matrix plot all the way over here, okay? Looking at that. So we say, what is the first thing that you would look at as far as trying to do an evaluation of this project? So again, you're all members of the independent consultant team or the independent consultant yourself, and you're having to do the evaluation, and this is what this is the results your folks have given you. What's the first thing that you, you point out? What's the first thing that you see? How about that big red box? You know, that's the first thing. So what, what's that box? That, that's the total risk, right? What's that telling you? So it, it's above the tolerable risk refer, reference, reference line for us, right, by, say, an order and a, order and a half magnitude. It's also above the annual probability of failure, right, as well. So it, it exceeds both of the risk measures from that standpoint. So that, that's the first thing that you ought to see, right? So total risk above both guidelines. That ought to be the first thing that comes out of all of that. And say, okay, this is what I've got here. Okay. Now, we talked about this again in the, in the last session. So that's the total, right? That, that's the sum of all of these. And again, some contribute more than others to that numerical total, right? It's just a matter of adding all of this up, arithmetic, okay? To be able to, to get that. So, so what failure modes are, what failure mode is contributing the most to the total project risk here. So let me give you some let me give you some examples. That one, that one, that one, that one there. Okay. So that one's that failure mode is plotting right at one times ten to the minus four. And if it came over to the table over here, and I'm just looking at probability of failure on this one, because there's just one there. There's actually two failure modes there, and that's these two. Okay, both of these have the same risk. So you've got two failure modes. They're both uh, annual probability of failure at one times 10 to the minus four. They've got the same consequence and have the same risk. One is an internal erosion into an outlet conduit. So that's under normal loading conditions. And the second one is foundation liquefaction, so an extreme loading condition. So we've got two different kinds of loading conditions on here, same risk. Okay? So what's, what's the next grouping or group of failure modes that contribute to the risk? Again, remembering that these are all lines of equal risk. Higher risk is to the upper right, lower risk, lower left. So as we're coming down along here, where, where would we go? Maybe there? All in agreement with that one there? So again, that one just so happens to have two of them associated with that. So we'll color code everything to keep track, okay? So this is now a yellow dot. We've got two failure modes again. So we'll look at this one, backward erosion piping. So that's an internal erosion process under the outlet conduit and spillway piers seismic cross canyon. So we've got another earthquake loading on the, on the spillway piers, okay? But we keep marching down through. So you see how you might rank these 
from a priority. So where will we go next? This one? Nope. This one? Am I closer? How about that one right there? Right? Because, again, we're coming down along the diagonal. That's, that, that's the next highest risk, right? So we'll, let's color code that one blue. And, again, we got two of them. So backward erosion piping through the foundation now. And now the hydrology folks get to be involved. So we, now we've got spillway, stilling, basin, scour associated with that. Again, another extreme loading condition. But that's the third set. So we could continue on because, like, like I mentioned earlier, so we would want to look at all of these just from a ranking standpoint. But do you understand the process that we would go through, right? So, so from here, we would come down to this line, and, and now we've got two sets of failure modes, again, all along the same risk, right? Same value of risk would be failure modes characterized by this dot and this one. And then we would go to these two, right? And then to these two and kind of coming down in in risk value right be able to do that but for the purposes of illustration let, let's stop there and let's say okay let's let's look at these and as far as some kind of prioritization in, in moving forward so so we know these red ones are are our highest ones first followed by the two yellow ones and in say fifth and sixth place we have the blue ones right but let's take a look at what that might look like so again, you'd have a longer list in, in this particular situation, but you'd have to have some type of initial assessment and prioritization or at least ranking here, okay? So we've got these two. So this one here now has a column that also has the risk values associated with it. So you can see these two are the same, these two are the same, these two are the same, okay? So here were our, our red failure modes on this. We have the backward erosion piping into the conduit, the foundation liquefaction, now a little bit more information for you, okay? So here we have some information on the confidence the team had in their risk estimates saying, hey, this, this one was low on that. And it was low, why? What, what, was, what was driving that? Well, we have uncertainty because we don't have any information, say, on blow counts in the foundation material. They, they, were, they were really trying to do their best in estimating based on engineering judgment, other factors that they knew about the project, loading conditions, slopes of the of the embankment perhaps other other information might be indirect to be able to come up with their overall estimate here for what the risk was uh, and they said I, i'm just low and, and here's why okay likewise backward erosion piping uh moderate confidence on this but there was uncertainty associated with initiation and continuation might have been something to do with uh, do I really have an unfiltered exit here to be able to allow backward erosion piping to, to start or to initiate? Was there something regarding the gradients on this? Did you actually have sufficient gradients to be able to start that process? Perhaps there, there wasn't enough information, uh, piezometric information or something along those lines to, to be able to provide a, a more definitive uh, kind of estimate on that or at least confidence in that estimate. So, so again, a couple of conflicting things in the sense that this is a normal load. This is an extreme load. And what we said earlier, you know, we might give the, the nod to the normal loading condition because that, that structure sees that load every day. The probability of that load is one on that. But we have some conflicting things here where, you know, well, maybe you might have looked at something that had a lower confidence in being able to move forward. Looking at other factors and things, you know, in different scenarios, you, you might reverse the ranking of these or 1A, 1B you know, type thing and going, going forward with this. Uh, so you, you, you'd want to have a bit more in trying to figure out how, how you might address those, okay? So you've got the same issues with each one of these other two kind of twins or pairs down here. Backward erosion piping, spillway piers. You've got low confidence here because there was no seismic analysis at all performed. So again, the team was using pure engineering judgment based on what they knew of the project size of the piers, the loading condition, uh, the, the condition the piers were in, other things regarding that, maybe connections of a, of a bridge deck on that as well, all sorts of other conditions, right? That all went in to their, their estimate of the annual probability of failure and then their confidence and kind of why, why were they uncertain? Like, boy, if you, if you had given me at least an analysis, maybe I could have gotten you a bit better. Again, versus backward erosion piping, same type of things, you know, I've got moderate confidence in this, but I have some initiation concerns regarding that. 
again, you'd have to decide how how you might want to rank those, or if it's just hey, I got a perfect tie here. The last one, same thing: backward erosion piping in the foundation on this one versus uh, scour. Okay, and going forward, same risk. Got high confidence here, moderate confidence and where the uncertainty is coming from. So in looking at the base and scour, you say, well, I, I've got high confidence in that. I probably won't be looking at trying to do any more studies, right? I'm, I'm already highly confident. I don't think anything else is going to affect my, my estimate on that. So given where the risk is, you might start looking and saying, hey, what, what kind of risk reduction measures might I be looking at to be able to address that particular ferry mode? So you might take that one into kind of a different set of what you might be looking at versus other ones here, all looking at like you might be trying to get at least some additional information, some studies associated with that in moving forward. The other thing you might notice, I mean, again, an independent consultant coming through looking at this and saying, well, you know, I've got backward erosion piping one, backward erosion piping two, by backward erosion piping three. Maybe there's some common thing that I could do with all of these that could really help. Maybe it's, again, gradation of certain materials. Maybe it's gradients, maybe it's something, but, but I might be able to get some efficiency here and address all three of these in, in one overall study to be able to help me assess these rather than maybe keeping these as three separate studies, maybe three separate consultants, three separate contracts going forward, right? To be able to do that. So you can look at some ways of being able to to combine some of these together, still keeping in mind what's really driving these. You don't want to lose that in, in that process of, of looking at efficiencies, but how you might look at that. So, so for each one of these that are kind of going into a study kind of phase, if I could have put it on, on this uh, chart, I would have. I would have put another column that might have looked something like this. And I put, you know, the Scara one in here just as an example, but it would be in a, kind of a different queue for you. So, so what kind of recommendation, given what I knew about backward erosion piping into the conduit, might be an appropriate recommendation to move forward? So I've just provided, a, 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 there's just a bunch of different examples in here. You certainly wouldn't go through and do all of these on that, but you would figure out what, what would be best targeted based on your uncertainty and where you think you could get your biggest bang for your buck. So just some ideas. Could be performing a joint survey and crack conditions from the inside of the outlet work conduit if it was large enough to be able to get in there or some kind of type of uh, ROV to be able to get that information. Perhaps it's about collecting samples of the zone one core material, performing gradation and Atterberg limits testing. Maybe it's installing piezometers, again, keeping in mind doing no harm here, in the vicinity of the conduit to measure hydraulic gradient in the core in the vicinity of the conduit. Maybe there's some interim risk reduction measures, a seal, any open joints or cracks in the conduit. Might be about inspection then of the conduit you know, uh, prior to any outlet operation so that you could be looking for materials that might have been deposited on the floor prior to kind of sweeping them out of the conduit and just to try to help verify what you had. There might be a whole series of recommendations associated with that or just one to say, hey, I think this is what you need to do in moving forward for each one of these. So it's the evaluation in trying to rank these, what would be an appropriate recommendation to be able to move forward on that. With that information, the licensee can take that and build that into your plan and say, okay, I agree, maybe I agree with all these, and I plan to get that one done in the next two years. Whatever the case might be, again, with this long list of things and knowing all the other things that are going on in your inventory. So for each one of these, let me go through each one, foundation liquefaction, same kind of things. I might not go out and just, you know, have a 30 boring, you know, drilling program based on no blow counts at the very beginning, but maybe you're going to look at a phased approach to be able to address it. So what do I know about the foundation alluvium underneath it? Could I have continuous low blow count material in the alluvium knowing what the depositional envir environment is? Am I in a meandering environment? Am I in a braided stream environment? Some, something in between? What do these deposits actually look like? I might want to get an idea what that is. Might even want to do all any type of investigation at some distance downstream of the dam to get a better idea of what those deposits might look like under the dam before doing some type of intrusive activity, uh, you know, into the dam itself. Just to get a sense, because I mean, some of that information, perhaps you can get that and, and be able to, you know, rule that failure mode out based on, on simplified methods, right? Preliminary methods, rather than having these very complicated, I mean, I've got Becker blow counts, I've got SPTs, I've got CPTs, 
you know, all these different things to, to try to go forward and say, you know, I'm going to figure it out. There are times when you need to do that, but maybe that's not the first thing that you would maybe want to go to, right? Spillway Pier, same thing, you know, so again, the uncertainty was in the engineering analysis, so, so maybe you want to do, again, a phased approach at, at looking at the, at the spillway piers. So I, I know all the structurals in the room would just love to recommend, a, you know, a three-dimensional nonlinear finite element method model to go through this and look at 25 earthquake records at the very first, you know, sniff of something like this. But maybe there's a preliminary way, right, to be able to do this and say, yeah, again, there are, there are times when that needs to be done. That, that's an, a certainly appropriate tool, but maybe there's an efficient way of looking at that, right, and being able to make that case. So other things like the, the basin scour. So it, maybe it's not about studies, but maybe it's, you know, hey, I need to think about measures to reduce the risk of, this, of the spillway basin scour. And in the meantime, I might want to do, from an interim standpoint, monitor flows, you know, during spillway discharges and certain, you know, when it exceeds a certain capacity to be able to take another survey to see what the damage is from an incremental standpoint. Because being where that risk is, that might be years before you might get to something like that, okay, to be able to move, move forward. So something like that as far as taking that, that evaluation and, and to be able to have something tangible associated with that particular ferry mode that's commensurate with the risk and the priority and the urgency all makes sense. Okay, so this is going to build on what we talked about before with regard to um, this risk evaluation thing and how we're using that to kind of like complete our risk assessment where we're actually going to recommend ways to manage the risk. So we're going to consider the levy system from the previous exercise, um, which was the, the levy that Carmen talked to you about earlier, 12 miles long. Um, I think it's about 65 feet high, has a sand foundation, looks mysteriously like a Mississippi River levee. Um, so going to use the results of a risk analysis that was done. And so this is the results of the PFMA. So we brainstormed a whole bunch of failure modes, came up with about 51 of those failure modes um, for that particular stretch of levee. We went through and we um, screened those, those failure modes and came up with two risk drivers, backwards, backwards erosion piping of the foundation leading to breach and overtopping of the levee control location leads to breach. So we have some full descriptions of those things all the way to breach. And so, you know, I talked earlier about um, when we do these presentations to our senior oversight group, LSOG, it's a little bit like, you know, this kind of like uh, doctoral thesis uh, defense and this is the types of slides that we're putting together to communicate our risk assessment. And so this would be a, a good example of kind of some of the things that we've done in the past to help build the case for our risk assessment and communicate it to decision makers. So we're talking about PFM1, backward erosion piping of the foundation. We got our cross section here of 50% loading of the levee is here. We had a 2019 flood um, that, uh, and sand boils were observed at that point approximately nine and a half foot differential head across, looks like about um, 1,200 feet as the seepage path link. So not a lot of head, a lot of space, and we're still seeing uh, boils down here. 50% um, loading is a 24 foot differential head and is approximately one foot above the 1993 flood, at which point we had a breach due to under seepage. So local geology supports the presence of low CU sands and a fine grain blanket. So that means this is probably likely some pipeable material and there's not a whole lot stopping it from going except for this seepage berm shown here in green, which is significant. Um, so, you know, this is a PFMA. Uh, a lot of times we don't, we don't use um, event trees specifically, but a lot of times we will come up with a vent tree. Why? Because it helps us aid, it aids us in the, in the discussion. It helps us, un, all the people who are listening and all the people who are reviewing this are actually in agreement about what exactly the steps in this failure are. And it also kind of helps the people in the, in the elicitation um, kind of focus on which are the most important nodes. So some of these no, nodes might be a one. They, they might be basically, they're very likely to occur, like a continuous path of fine to medium uniform sand. I mean, if this really is a Mississippi River, river levee, that's pretty much true all, all up and down the lower you know, the lower part of the Mississippi. So, but there's some of these which are, you know, um, 
sufficient gradient exists to initiate backward erosion piping, you know, a lot of this risk assessment is going to uh, is going to occur around that node and maybe a couple of others here. So that really kind of tells us where we need to focus our discussion and coming up with a, a, an estimate of risk. And so also something else that really helps us build this case and document what we've done is for each one of these nodes, we are bringing out the fine points here. So for initiation, sand boils initiation were observed in the bottom of the detention basin in 2019. Differential head was nine and a half. So if our critical flood that we're assuming in the risk assessment is the 50% flood, which has a differential head of 24 feet, there's a high likelihood for occurrence of critical flood loading. So it's bringing out some essential information that um, really kind of builds the case for what we thought was going to happen. Okay, so I'm going to show you the results of this particular of, 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 the, of the risk assessment of this particular failure mode here in a couple of slides. Let's focus for a second on our other risk driving failure mode, overtopping. So overtopping at the levee control location leads to breach. Um, so top of levee is one in 50,000. Half a foot of overtopping is something less frequent. One foot less more, even less more frequent, even less frequent. Uh, and 1.8 feet of less frequency. So why do we have all these right here? Well, it's really, it, when we're thinking about overtopping, it's, it's, it's easier to think about it in, in terms of depth of overtopping. So, um, and, you know, we consider other things in this, like do we have a good grass cover? Um, what are the levee materials made out of? And what is the depth and duration of overtopping going to be? So overtopping is likely to be known days in advance. So that helps us with two things to get people out of the way of the flood. And it also helps us give us some time to get our flood fighting operations ramped up. If there's some low spots or maybe we can sandbag this thing, maybe we can avoid the problem. Good sod cover, levy consists of clays, good and good. Um, so there might be some resilience to overtopping here. So it's not gonna fail immediately. Um, so this again is our event tree. Um, you know, slope, pro slope protection fails, we got some Good grass cover, overtopping duration of two days. So long and short. Um, so these are the results of those two potential failure modes, the risk assessment for those two potential failure modes. PFM1 is, again, backward erosion piping, PFM3, overtopping. So three overtopping. So the team essentially said that, you know, incipient overtopping is somewhere right here. But this thing could stand up to a little bit of overtopping. It's going to go on for it looks like about two days, based on this previous slide. It's clay. It's uh, it's got a good grass cover, so maybe it can it can withstand you know a foot, a half a foot, a foot of overtopping um, before it fails. And so the difference between incipient overtopping and uh, one foot of overtopping is at least an order of magnitude, and I think that's what we're seeing in these risk results right here. So this is our risk driving failure mode here, PFM1, BEP. And it's noticed that it is at least one order of magnitude below incipient overtopping. Um, so we have two life safety um, matrices right here. One for with life safe, sorry, we have two matrices here. One for life safety and one for uh, economic losses. Um, note these things are plotting in the same position on the APF, annual probability of failure, but in different locations for different consequences. We're going to consider both of those, but life safety is what's really driving the train here. So these are the results of the risk analysis. There are more pieces to consider in what we're going to do about the risk than just what the, the dots or the boxes on the plot are telling us. So we have those other four tolerability risk guidelines that we need to think about, which really revolve around, you know, what are the levy, the people who operate that levy, what are they doing? You know, what, there, there's, there's got, a risk assessment is, is not nearly enough to replicate the complexity of real life. There's more things involved. And so we need to consider all things at our hand, at our fingertips. <clears throat> So here is a comparison of risk assessments. So we did a screening probably about five to 10 years ago. Um, and this is the results of our current SQRI that I just went over with you guys. Risk drivers looked like about the same. Uh, abatement erosion was one, but not really, a, not really something that was considered when we had some actual, you know, a group of um, humans looking at it. PAR looks like it's about the same. 
Life loss, uh, a little different here with overtopping. So 0.1 to 1 with overtopping, but something more considerable here. Um, so uh, consequences went down a little bit. Over, uh, overtopping AP, pretty close to the same. Um, APF failures per year actually went down. So went down about uh, half order magnitude, I think due to the fact that our consequences went down a little bit. Um, and average annual life loss, it has gone, has gone down as well. And so LSAC was a four during the screening and now it's either a five, either a four or a five. So is it an LSAC four or is it an LSAC five? Um, so the, I think the team who did the risk assessment recommended five and I think LSAC, LSOG agreed with them. Um, and the really diff the difference between LSAC four and LSAC five, these definitions are basically identical except for this word, low risk and very low risk. So wh why would we have called this very low risk? Especially if, you know, and here's where we're plotting against the rest of the core portfolio of levies. Sir, it's very low. Uh, it's a low, you know, it's got a low uh, annual probability of failure. But we have some life loss associated with this. You know, it's the life loss is three to 30. So that's not insignificant. So there's some other things that the team, that LSOG and the team considered to call this an LSAC 5. Um, we also had to um, make a recommendation for the National Flood Insurance Program as a part of this risk assessment. This one is kind of a slam dunk. Um, it's currently accredited by FEMA for NFIP based on information provided in the flood insurance study uh, from 2015. Had a total annual probability of inundation of two times in the minus five. So, you know, we want to pass the one in 100 flood, which plots right about here um, with 90% confidence, which plots right about here. And we're plotting all the way down here. So pretty easy to say this should be included in the national flood insurance program. Not too controversial there. Um, so we recommended the levy system be accredited. They reviewed the own in manuals, emergency planning, some of those other things that need to be considered, and they were judged adequate to meet the requirements of FEMA accreditation purposes. So what about those other tolerability guidelines that are going to be something that accounts for how the people who live behind the levy act and how those who are responsible for managing the levy act? So um, are they met? TRG1. Understanding the risk. Are individual risks and levy reliability tolerable? Yes. So not only are we meeting our societal risk here, um, but we are also greater than one order of magnitude below our incipient overtopping. So yes and yes on that. Um, TRG2, building risk awareness. Local sponsors and emergency managers are using information from the risk assessment to improve the emergency action plan with a focus on communication to local businesses during the flood events so that messaging can reach transient population during an event. So I think they're indicating here that they've already got some pretty good communication with the people who actually live behind this dam or this levy, excuse me, or if they're just businesses behind here, they're actually reaching out to the transient population who may not have cell phones, who may not have a home. And so they're doing everything that they can. They're really getting into the details of getting people out of the way should some sort of a flood occur. TRG3, fulfilling daily responsibilities. Local sponsor has a well-established and robust inspection and maintenance program. Uh, the risk communication between USACE and the levy district is active ongoing. You know, everybody's got each other's phone numbers. They're talking more than a couple of times a year or more than like once every couple of years, you know. They have some rapport with each other. They, uh, they work together. Local sponsor was an active participant in the SQRA and actively engages with USACE on routine levy safety activities. So, you know, that, that, necessarily, ne that doesn't necessarily mean the local sponsor was, um, you know, making elicitations on individual failure modes, but that particular sponsor was there and in person and listening to it and saying, you know what, you know, that doesn't sound quite right to me. Actually, this is what happened during the 2019 flood and it happened this way, it happened that way. They're contributing. They're giving us their local knowledge. Um, and TRG4, actions to reduce the risk. Constructed a seepage remediation at the West End Pump Station ponding, ponding Basin to address potential for sand boil initiation. 
Updated the EAP to include prior overtopping failure modes in coordination with DOT for red clo road closures. So they're even thinking about should this breach occur in a place that is has been, you know, kind of dictated by the risk assessment. What's the best way to get people out? Because there's a low spot in this road over here, so they can't go through here. So we got to go through some other place. So they're doing all the things that they can do it, that, that they can. So um, that's why I think they came back and said, this is an LSAC 5 versus an LSAC 4. Because I think this could have been either given where it plots. So it's these, it's, it's these other intangibles that drives um, the decision makers to decide which way to go on this. So let's talk about what some possible recommendations for that could be. You know, again, this is a pretty low risk levy. Enhance risk communication with PAR, with, with the uh, population at risk, particularly the, with the transient population in advance of a flood se season. So they're already starting to move towards that. Um, update the emergency action plan to address lessons learned from the risk assessment. Continue pre-flood preparation meetings and consider incorporation of tabletop exercises with USACE local sponsors, EMAs, DOT. You know, let's, let's get that EAP out. Let's pretend the flood's happening. Let's call those numbers. Let's, you know, see how the information disseminates. Let's actually put that plan into action um, to see how it goes. Incorporate known seepage locations into a site-specific flood inspection checklist. Um, you know, risk assessments really bring things like that out. Where are the critical vulnerabilities? Let's communicate that to the people who are going to be on the ground when a flood's happening so that they know where to go and, and to look first for problems. And develop and implement a regular inspection program for all third-party tow drains, pavement under drains that have been installed with or along the seepage berm because it's a possible vulnerability too. So already, you know, these recommendations would probably look a lot different if this were a higher risk levy. Like, let's go put a seepage berm somewhere or, you know, this particular section of the levy needed to be raised or some to that effect. But because this was a low risk levy, there's still things that we can do to reduce the risk. You know, it's, it's like a journey. It, it's, there's no real destination. We want to continually act to reduce risk. All right. So... We applied some examples of L2 or ISQA results uh, to methods of evaluation. 